What's the difference between God and a neurosurgeon? God doesn't think he's a neurosurgeon. <laughs> a neurosurgeon is someone who operates on the human brain and spine. And because of that, we believe, albeit erroneously, that we are on the top of this medical totem pole of medical specialists. We have this reputation of being arrogant and occasionally even obnoxious. We are this progeny of elitist uh, super specialists who have the advantage of looking inside the human brain on a daily basis. And yet, we still haven't figured out most, how most of it works. Researchers tell us that we use only about 10% of our brain. And we've all had special encounters with people who use much less than that. <laughs> God resides in the human brain. This is Michelangelo's famous uh, Sistine Chapel painting of the creation of Adam. And the hand of God touching Adam is actually the encompassment of the human brain. We figured this out only about five centuries later. About 100 years ago, there were no specialists to operate on the brain. Brain surgery was performed by general surgeons, even obstetricians and gynecologists for that matter. And they removed brain tumors in the pre much way they removed babies. Mortality on operating on the human brain was 100%. A general surgeon by the name of Robert Liston actually beat that statistic. He was a general surgeon who was known to perform super speed amputations. And once, while doing one of his knee amputations, he sliced through the fingers of his assistant. And because of uncontrollable blood loss, both the patient and the assistant died. Another surgeon, watching and observing the operation, had a heart attack because he couldn't stand the bloodshed. So he technically performed surgery with 300% mortality. <laughs> a lot has changed since then. Once upon a time, neurosurgery was considered successful if the patient came out alive after an operation, even if it was in a vegetative state. A Couple of years later, if patients went home the same way, they came into the operating room, that was considered success. And then, decades later, we started improving neurological function. Today, a patient who has had brain or spine surgery can go home the same day or the next with improved neuro neurological function, alleviation of pain, and enhanced quality of life. It's, 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 it's incredible if you think about it, but what has made all this possible? What has made this possible? We are now able to study the brain in more detail. We've mastered anatomy, we've mastered physiology. We can look at fiber tracks like we've never looked at them before. With augmented reality and virtual reality, we can actually tiptoe into someone's brain and look around brain tumors and vascular malformations. We can actually operate on patients while they're awake. We can remove tumors from the brain while talking to patients, especially tumors that involve, involve eloquent areas of the brain which control hand and leg function, we can actually check hand leg function, speech, while the patient is fully awake. We can maximize tumor resection in that fashion. We can enhance safety. We can improve outcomes. All this while chatting with the patient throughout the operation. Initially, we used to operate with naked eyes, and then came the microscope, which made the operating experience extremely ethereal. And now we can light up brain tumors with fluorescence, and that helps us delineate these ugly monsters from normal brain. And that's the great advantage that we've made. We can actually operate on brain tumors through people's nose. This patient had a tumor compressing the optic nerve. And here we are with endoscopes removing the brain tumor. She came completely blind and went home with normal vision through a very simple operation done through the nose. Just because I'm saying it's simple, don't try it at home. 
Okay. <laughs> but if you look at it, it's not that simple. Simple is actually really hard. It's only the surgeon that makes it seem so. Training in neurosurgery, you need to train in med school for about five to seven years. And then you spend an equal amount of time doing neurosurgical residency. Most of that is spent in suboptimal conditions, working 20 to 24 hours a day, sacrificing family, friends, and another four-letter word that starts with F, food. It takes about 15 years to learn how to operate. But it takes 15 more years to learn when not to operate. And with all this training, we can now enter the brain through the nose, through the eye, through the ear. I mean, please don't imagine any other orifice. But as unimaginable as it may sound, you can actually enter the brain through the groin. You can guide wires through the groin up into tiny vessels in the brain and remove blood clots, coil aneurysms, embolize vascular malformations, and all this is possible with a single needle prick. If we had to do this by opening the head, like we did it a while ago, this is what it would look like. The same operation, though to a neurosurgeon sounds absolutely fascinating, to looking at this pristine anatomy, removing a blood clot from a vessel. It's like delivering a baby, but uh, only much cooler. <laughs> when you talk about the topic of babies, we have actually now been able to operate on fetuses with spinal cord defects. We can remove them from the uterus, seal the defect, put them back into the womb, and allow for pregnancy to continue normally. Isn't that miraculous? We've been able to separate Siamese twins conjoined at the head, sharing the entire same body blood supply. And that itself is fascinating to me. This is what an operation theater looked like in the past. It was actually a theater where the surgeon performed <laughs> and people watched him perform. And now the robot has entered the operating room. Everything is 3D. We have a navigation system, and everything is smart and cyber. It all looks like the cockpit of an airplane. Functional neurosurgery has started gaining momentum. We can insert an electrode into someone's head and cure tremors of Parkinson's disease. We can actually get a professional violinist or a guitarist who has a spasm in his hands while playing one particular note. We get him into the operating room, get him to play where he has the problem, and smack that area of the brain with an electrode, and he's cured. We're now doing that for depression, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, bipolar disorder, and who knows, even erectile dysfunction. <laughs> but here's the question. Can we use the power of tweaking the human brain to achieve immortality? Can you insert an electrode into a rapist's prefrontal cortex and a couple of hours later, he's turned into a masiya for protecting women's rights and empowering women. Can we use transcranial magnetic stimulation to soften hardened criminals? Basically, I'm asking is, can we use neurosurgery to transform society to become kinder, gentler, softer? I mean, my friends here will argue that Art of Living can do that. But, I mean, wouldn't you want to be done within three, four hours than having to meditate for 30 minutes every day for the rest of your life? <laughs> I mean, can we move from actually wanting to cure disease to enhance the quality of life? 
Can we regulate certain centers in the brain to become more intelligent, to augment memory? I mean, can Roger Federer, if he wants to practice on his backhand and no amount of practice and coaching is doing that for him, can he undergo some neuromodulation and win a few more Grand Slams? Can someone on the death penalty be given one last chance to turn their lives around? How many senses do you think all of us have? Most of us will say five, touch, sound, hearing, smell, sight. And we have about 22 to 23 senses, a sense of balance, a sense of movement, a sense to figure out where your body part is without actually looking at it, the sense to experience the passage of time, the feeling of pain, temperature. I mean, I don't know if a sense of humor makes it to that list. <laughs> but we have certain senses that animals have, the ability to feel magnetic fields around them the ability to navigate through polarized light. I mean, what if we could externally enhance these senses to become a better person, to increase awareness, to become mindful, or simply just stay protected? Is exploring the hidden potential of our brain by means of these devices even ethical? Is it acceptable in today's society? Or is this just some sort of audacious optimism that we are talking about? Are we really trying to play God? I don't have the answers. I'm only the one asking the questions. But then there is this huge discrepancy of healthcare and who it's available to. These are the two operating chairs that I sit on in two different hospitals that I work. And this just sums up the entire discrepancy. The question actually is that do we need for paradigm shifts to take place, fancy gadgets, gizmos, financial investments, do we actually need to focus on creating a dozens of baby Einsteins, or should we try and work at the grassroots level? A couple of years ago, there was this surgical checklist that was introduced by the WHO. What it did was it helped surgeons pause before every operation for three minutes, like you have in aviation, and go through a sequence of events. Is this the correct patient that you're operating on? It's not funny. This actually installation of this checklist across various socio-economic backgrounds, across various centers in the world, reduced complications and mortality by 30 to 40 percent. Sometimes it's the little things in life that makes a big difference. What it did was it helped prepare teams prepare for the unexpected. See, success is not about winning or losing. It's about the mastery of rescue. And all of us want to get better. And better is possible. It doesn't take genius. It takes ingenuity. It takes moral clarity. It takes ethics. But above all, it takes a willingness to try. However, sometimes things don't go according to plan. One must accept that patients, at some point or the other, will become a part of a doctor's learning curve. And neurosurgical disasters can be cruel. You can do a perfectly oper perfect operation and have a patient come out of the operating room only to die a few days later of some unknowable stroke or hemorrhage unrelated to the tumor. Nobody, nobody other than a neurosurgeon understands the pain of seeing someone every day, sometimes for months on end, whom he has harmed, and face the wrath of angry relatives, upset relatives, and rightly so. Nobody teaches this to us in medical school.
Here at one end, we're trying to talk about robotics and augment reality and all of that stuff. We haven't even figured out how to cure cancer. I mean, 30 years ago, someone with the highest grade of brain cancer spent 30,000 rupees and lived for three months. Today, you'd spend 30 lakh rupees, and the survival is not more than three years anywhere in the world. We're only now beginning to realize that everybody's cancer is like their own fingerprint. It's individualized. It requires its own molecular subtyping. And we need to use precision medication and targeted therapy rather than just multiple rounds of radiation and chemo. Forget cancer, even benign tumors, we're not able to treat fully. They keep coming back despite everything that we've done, tumors that are not malignant. We like to call them mother-in-law tumors. <laughs> the next time you visit a surgeon, consider the psychological realities he or she is facing. Good physicians are rarely dispassionate. They agonize and grieve over patients. Unfortunately, medicine is built on mistakes, and doctors like most of us, learn by committing blunders. Every surgeon has a cemetery to which he goes from time to time to pray, a cemetery of bitterness and regret to be able to seek answers for his failures. Today, the world is moving towards spirituality. We have people around us who have a better knowledge of the self, the mind, and the subtle body. With a little bit of practice and guidance, we can learn to enrich ourselves, to rid ourselves of negativity, and to reshape our lives, and live a miraculous one. I think paradigms will truly shift when we combine technology and medicine and nourish spirituality for holistic healing for one and for all. It's not only a neurosurgeon who has the license to perform miracles. Miracles lie in each one of us. Miracles lie in compassionate gestures, a kind word, a soft touch. Miracles lie in extraordinary ordinariness. And that is what brings you closer to God. The greatest game changer in neurosurgery will be when someone in the US, Europe, China, Japan performs the first world's actual complete head transplant. We in India don't have to worry about lagging behind in that department. We did ours a few centuries ago. <laughs> Thank you very much.